Well, good to have you with us this morning. We're going to have a good time looking at God's Word this morning. And uh, we're looking at a, one of our words that you uh, gave to me to, to talk about today. So, yes, run, run. Okay. And, and today the, the word that we're going to talk about is crown. Now, I don't know where um, people got the, the ideas for these, and that's, that's totally fine. So we're just going with it. The, I'm going to infer some things about it. Um, so, so far we've talked about the whole idea of being in Christ, the whole idea of having a personal relationship with Jesus. That was the first week we talked about how critical and important that was. And last week we talked about the idea of working and, and that God gives us work. It's, it's not a curse. In fact, it can be a great blessing in our lives. And so reminder that the work is a, is a value to God. And in fact, work is also value to us physically and emotionally. So there's some good things that come out of work. And I think, yeah, and so, so today we want to talk about this idea of crowns or crowns. And, and so what are we actually focusing on? It's, it's maybe not exclusively what we think of as a crown. You probably have in your mind uh, something that, um, that you see royalty wearing um, today when you see a picture of the queen or, 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 or a king on the news, you see, you see a crown. And so you're probably thinking of something like that. And that's really not what we're talking about today. In fact, it's not going to be really even that close to it. But crowns in the Bible, in the, in the biblical record, were things that were passed down. Uh, in, in Israel, the, the, the kings passed their crowns down. So there was a, there was a crown that was there. And, and so when a king was anointed king, the uh, crown was placed on their head. And, and so there's sort of been a, a generational thing, and that's something we've seen done over and over and over again, and we even see it happening today. So this whole idea of a crown was really important. Um, I'm always amazed that sometimes uh, crowns are very ornate, and yet sometimes they're very simple, but they're just a symbol. They're a picture. They're, a, they're, they're, they're something to set something apart. So this idea of a crown was given to kings, and it was passed down through Israel. Um, it's also in the Old Testament, it's a, the idea or the word crown gets connected to the idea of blessing. So, so the crown of a person can be an excellent wife, their children, their grandchildren. Uh, it can even be gray hair, Proverbs tells us, uh, that gray hair is a crown. So, um, so we, we take all of those things as a picture of appreciation and of honor and a sign of blessing, God's blessing in our lives. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul even refers to people as his crown. And in Philippians, when he's talking to them, he says, I could look at all of the things that I've got in my life. I can think of the, the goodness of God and his blessing in my life. I could look at that. I can look at that what I've been able to attain in this life and, and the, the successes I've had in my ministry. But the crown in my life is you, Philippian people that I've pointed to the Savior. The, you're, the, they're the, you're the thing that I really am joyous about. You are the, the thing that I value highly. So there's a lot of different ideas. So what kind of crown are we talking about? That's really what we're gonna get to today. I'm gonna focus on the idea of the crowns that we find in the New Testament. And we're gonna look at them um, in, in each of their sort of contexts to see sort of what it is that we're, 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 we're talking about and what the purpose of them are. So the New Testament idea came from um, the arena or the track. So it was the idea of, of athletic endeavor. And at the end of those athletic endeavors, those that had won the, the individual contest were given a crown. It was a sign. It was a sign that they were the winners. They were the, the winners of the competition, whatever it was. Sometimes it was something physical. Sometimes it was endurance, like a race. Sometimes it was a different activity, but that's what it was. And, and so the crown, just, just so we're really clear on what we're talking about here, um, it was a, it was a, a long branch that they got, actually got twisted together. And so the, the Greek word actually talks about the idea of braiding or twisting. And then that's what a crown was. In their world, and and so, so so they were. The suggestion was that when I was reading about them, the suggestion was they were sort of more than just one branch. They were pretty significant um, in size, and probably several branches all twisted together, lots of leaves going on, and they were placed on the head of the winner, the victor. So, 
so here's the idea. Here's the picture of it. They would they would compete in a competition, and the winner would would be determined at the end of it. And then they would have this ceremony where they would give them the crown. And they would put this wreath of leaves on their head. So you so now you can imagine. So like sort of you know for the next day or two. Um, the, the crown would be worn. So as the games continued on and as people sort of continued competing, uh, those that had won already would continue to wear the crown. And so you'd be walking down the street and you go, there's a guy who's got a Caesar salad on his head. But that's not what it was at all. It was to, but it was, it was intended to draw attention to them. That, that they were the winners. They were the victors. They were the ones that had, that had competed and had d defeated everybody else. That was, the, that was the idea of it. Okay? So, so as we sort of think of the crown being won, we have to think of it in terms of that's what it was. It was a, it was a symbol of victory. It was a symbol of achievement. And it was, it was valued. Those things were valued highly. And so, again, I just wanted to, to sort of drive home that point was that we think of a crown probably as gold with precious stones in it. And that, that would be valuable in our, in our economy. But in their world, the accolades that came from simply wearing uh, a crown made from a few branches twisted and braided together and placed on their head was what they were competing for. So... We get to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. So if you want to turn there, you can. I'll, I'll just read the, the verses that talk about the crowns, and, um, and then I'll describe sort of what the context is. So if you don't want to turn in your Bible or you didn't bring it because um, you, you thought we were outside, that's totally fine. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 is, is talking about this idea. And the Apostle Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he's talking to them about the things that are important and the things that are not. And he's trying to lay beside each, each other the things that are, that are really important to God and the things that are not important to God. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 says this. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, crown. But we, Paul says, do it for an imperishable. So the, the, the point that Paul is, is driving home is this, that, that people in Corinth, you know what happens, that, that athletes work hard, they deny themselves, they, they, they go into strict training to accomplish something. And, and they do it, and invest all that effort and energy and time and discipline into accomplishing something and then winning a, a prize that will not last. So you sort of think of it in terms of that day. You're, you're talking about a branch. Like how long are the leaves going to stay on a branch once it's been cut from a tree? Not long. A few days. Maybe a few weeks. But eventually there's going to be nothing left of that crown and yet people were willing to invest literally years of their life in order to accomplish that to to acquire that thing that was not going to last very long at all and paul says this they invest that way and corinth was a spot where they had uh, their own set of games in fact they were the second largest only to the olympics that were held in athens and and corinth had those games so they, they knew this well and Paul is saying, but, but listen to me, my dear brothers and sisters, when we look at those that, that, that come to this city and they, they participate and they do it, they do it for something that's not going to last for very long. He says, but I want you to invest your life in something that's more important than just a wreath, that this is, that's going to last longer than just a couple of weeks. It's going to be something that is going to be imperishable. It's going to last forever. You know, Really, that should be the motivation of our lives in so many ways. That really should be the thing that, that drives us forward as followers of Jesus, that we ought to be investing our life in things that are going to last forever. And, and so we really should be motivated by this idea that, that what matters to God should matter to us. And the question we have to ask ourselves today is, what will our trophies be at the end of our lives? What will our trophies be? Where are we investing our time and our energies? What's it going to 
matter at the end. I don't know about you, but um, trophies are they're, they're great to win. They're fun to win. But, but the reality is even, even the greatest trophies that we get, kind of the whole excitement and, and sense of accomplishment sort of fades after a while, doesn't it? I don't know, but you've had this experience, but we've moved a few times. And I've, I was always amazed at the number of times that I picked up a box that, that had a bunch of trophies in it that hadn't been opened since the last time we moved. And uh, so the last time I, I went through this process, I picked this up and I opened this box. And I said, what, what are we doing hauling these things around? And, and I looked at it and there were some, there were some sports things that we'd won in, in tournaments playing baseball or basketball and volleyball and those sorts of things. And so um, I remember, okay, those, those are great. There was one, one um, that um, I was really proud of. Um, it was a, a baseball league I played in in, in Toronto and f for some fluke reason this year I won the most valuable player of the league and and so I got this trophy and and I would the, what made it really cool was that uh, Jerry Howarth who was the play-by-play -play announcer for the Blue Jays actually gave it to me he presented it to me which is kind of really way out there and that was that's what really made it special but even that was in the box there's a bunch of stuff from work you know awards and certificates and all kinds of stuff. But the reality was this, that, that the stuff that I invested lots of time and energy into was in a box. Gathering dust, not being looked at, it really didn't impact my life at all. And I know for sure it's not gonna matter when it's all said and done. It won't be the thing that defines my life at all. And Paul says, these athletes, they invest their time and their energy and their effort to get a, a crown, a wreath that's only going to last days, weeks, months, months, maybe. So, but I want you to invest your life into something that's much bigger than that, that's going to last for eternity. I want you to invest your life into people. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what, what are our trophies going to be at the end of it? Is your life going to be defined by a box full of dusty pieces of metal? Or is it going to be defined by something better and bigger and more significant than that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 goes on. It gives us another one of those crowns. And, and here we sort of see Paul turning the, the picture a little bit. He says, so, so, and this is 1 Thessalonians 2.19. 1 Thessalonians 2.19. For what is our hope or joy, and, and here's the word now, or crown of boasting? What is it that I'm excited about? What am I going to tell people about before our Lord Jesus at his coming? What is it that I'm going to say, Jesus, here's what I did with my life when, when he returns? Jesus, this is what I'm, this is what I've spent my life days on earth doing and Paul asks this question isn't it you Thessalonians isn't it you that would that we think are most important see we get so caught up into the the accumulation and the the the, the possessing of things and Paul says but really when it comes right down with the thing that I want to be able to show to the Savior is is that it's you it's the people and he cares about them deeply. And so he, he goes on and he says that, that, that the stuff of this life is, is great, but the people there in Thessalonica are even more important. Then in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter sort of takes on this, this same thought and he's talking about pastors and he's talking about leaders in churches. And so, so here's the, sort of the, the next sort of thing that we get. And this is a, this is a crown that, that is identified and given to those that, that lead in churches, that serve well in churches. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. And when the chief shepherds, shepherd appears, that's Jesus, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And so, and so I think we need to understand, we need to, we need to respect and honor those that serve in the church for, for our benefit. I mean, I've been a recipient of many, many people that have poured into my life and, and recognize that God has a place for them, a place of a blessing 
this crown of glory is going to be theirs because they've invested in people. They, they saw the importance of people. So all those crowns all put together sort of talk about the idea of the value of people and the things that, that, that matter and last for eternity are what we should be investing into. Because ultimately the crown or the thing that sets us apart, the thing that brings us glory and honor and, and sees the blessing of God ultimately are going to be the things that matter in eternity. And that, that is people. It's not things. So the glory and the reward for work is people. It's not accumulation of things. Next thought I want to talk about comes out of 2 Timothy chapter 4. And these are words that get read if, if I'm doing a, a funeral, especially when we come to the gravesite, where we're talking about a person who has, has passed away, but they are followers of Jesus. And I love these words because they are words of hope. The words of hope beyond this life. It says this, and this is, this is Paul literally writing to Timothy as Paul is about to, to die, to, to pay the, the price for sharing the good news of Jesus. It says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. Athletics again. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me the here the, here's the words, crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. This crown of righteousness is, is given to literally every follower of Jesus. Everyone that has trusted in Christ as their Savior and, and has eternal life, we, we, we have this thing called the crown of righteousness. And, and righteousness, remember, is that, that word of being in a right place before a holy God. So in a, in a right spot before a holy God. That's what righteousness talks about. And, and so, so we, we see our brokenness, our sinfulness, our rebellion, our failure, our faults, our shame, and we see the holiness of God. And yet, through what Jesus does for us, through the payment of the penalty for our brokenness, we are, we are seen as righteous before a holy God. How is this possible? Not by what we do, but what Jesus has already done for us. And so, so here's why it says this. The crown of righteousness is, is ready for me that Jesus is actually going to award me on that day if, if, if I'm one of those people that love the idea, the idea of his appearing, his coming back for, for his people. So, so those that have a relationship with Jesus, all of us will get the crown of righteousness. And people, we need to understand that that's the thing that sets us apart and says, they're, they're bought. They are, they are children of God. They are God's special gift. And, and they've received forgiveness. They are placed in that right relationship with Jesus. And how do I know? Because they have the crown of righteousness. They're marked out as different. Now hold on to that thought for just a second, because that's for every follower of Jesus. Crown of righteousness. The reward of a sinner being placed in a right relationship, restored relationship with God, is this crown of righteousness. One more sort of crown. Revelation chapter 2, uh, verses 10 and following. It's in the middle of, of, the, of the Apostle John talking to all of the churches of, of Turkey, Asia Minor in those days, but what is today modern day Turkey. And, and he's writing to these churches and he's giving them instruction, but in the middle of Revelation 2, he becomes to verse 10. And it says this, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. I want, you to, I want you to hear this. That as followers of Jesus, there will be things that are going to cause us to suffer. And he says, I don't want you to be all, all worked up about him and, and so overwhelmed by it. And then it says this. Look at, look at what it says. 
These are, these are prophetic words. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested for 10 days for a short time. You will have tribulation. There's going to be hard stuff in our lives. So follower of Jesus, do not, please do not get this sense that just being a follower of Jesus brings all kinds of, of good and, and, and blessing and happiness and there's never any bad days, there's never any struggles, there's never any trials. That is not true and that's not what Jesus said about being a follower of him. He said that you're going you're to struggle and you're going to have trial and there's going to be people that push back against you and that's okay because it's only going to be for a little while. In the, in the scope of eternity, whatever we have to endure in this moment of life is, is brief. And so, so, so hang on. And then it says this, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. I want you to get the hope that is in that verse. Because we, we, we can look at it and say, yeah, we know that the tough times, being a follower of Jesus, doesn't mean a free pass from suffering. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be just wonderful. And it doesn't mean that everybody's going to love us. And it doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree with us. And it doesn't mean that, that life is going to be rosy all the time. There's going to be some hard stuff that happens to us. We need to understand that. But, but that's not the definition of our life. The, the definition of the defining moment of our life is that, that one day, that, that if we persevere, to, if we do not give up, if we hang on to Jesus, that the, the end result is that we receive the crown of life. And we need to grab onto that thought that we are destined for life, not for destruction. That's the hope of a follower of Jesus. It does not matter how hard life gets. It does not matter how difficult the challenges and circumstances of this life are. That that, that is not the defining moment for us. That the hope that we have being followers of Jesus is that, that even though death may come to us physically, that the hope that we have is that of eternal life. And, and it is symbolized and pictured in this great picture that says you hang on. Jesus says, and one day when you see me face to face, you will get the crown of life that I promised to anyone that believes. We are destined for life, not for destruction. So what's the end of the story? The end of the story is this. Because now you sort of, if you sort of think of where we've come and where we've, what we've talked about, Really important for us to understand that that's, that's not the end of the story. Because you're probably asking yourself, well, what do I do with these crowns? If I've got these crowns uh, at the end of, of life, and these are the, the blessings, the, the honor that I get from, from our Heavenly Father, what do we do with them? And, and so here's, here's the thought that I want you to sort of think about. Because remember the idea, if you go all the way back to where we started on this, the idea of the crown was to set a person apart, right? It was that person walking through the streets at, at, the, at the games, the competitions. It was that person walking through the streets, and they had that crown on. And, and everybody walking around looked like you and me, but there was this one guy, there was one lady that had that crown on, and, and they were set apart as different, right? They were the winner of an activity, an event, of a race. They were, they were set apart, but... But now, thankfully, for everyone that is a follower of Jesus, we get that crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, is going to give to us, to everyone that loves him. So now, let's sort of fast forward. So now we stand before Jesus. We stand before the Almighty God. We stand before the God of the universe. And we're all wearing a crown. So what sets us apart? And, and, and so remember the idea is to, to, to bring glory and, and attention and honor to the person that, that wore the crown. But now we're all standing there and we all have our crowns on and it's like, so what sets us apart? Because the one that is set apart should be the one that has all the crowns, right? The one, that, the one that's different should be the one that, that, that everyone is paying attention to and looking at. And look what Revelation chapter 4 says. And here's a picture fast-forwarding. I think it's a picture of what we're going to do too. 
I think this is the example of what happens when we are confronted with the awesomeness of God. Whenever the Revelation 4 verses 9 through 11, this is what it says. And wherever the living creatures give glory and honor to thanks, look at, here's, here's it, to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They, 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 they go and we, they worship the eternal God of the universe. And look what they do. Look what they do. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by you they were existed and were created. See that, that great picture of us in the presence of God one day as we stand there with our crowns of righteousness that were bought by the blood of Jesus because of his great love for you and for me. As we're all standing there, we recognize, I think we will recognize more fully and completely that, that we deserve none of the credit, that it's only him that deserves all of it. And I think the, the easy response will be, why am I wearing this? I am not worthy. Only, only Jesus is worthy. And we cast our crowns at his feet, just like those 24 elders do in the throne room, that, that they recognize that, that nothing about them is ordinary, that everything about Jesus is extraordinary. And so the only response that we can have is worship and adoration, and we throw those crowns at his feet. So, so let, me just, let me just wrap up my thoughts here by saying this, that we can work hard, we should work hard, we should work hard in this world to to point people to the hope of a savior, his name is Jesus. We should, we should work hard at helping them understand that, that, that peace and joy comes from relationship with who? Him, and that forgiveness and redemption has already been accomplished for us. We need to share that good news with them. And one day when we stand before the one that loved us so much, he died for us. He died for you, he died for me. When, when, we, st when we stand before him, the, 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 the picture, the emblem, the honor that we get is gonna seem so misplaced. And it's gonna be so obvious that I deserve none of it, that he deserves all of it, that that, that is gonna be the ultimate response. So while we work hard in this life to achieve some sort of, of of accolade or, or honor or glory for, for ultimately for God's glory, it, it, surely, it surely will become so apparent that one day it's really all about him and what he's done. And we deserve none of it. So we work hard in this life, not to bring glory and honor to us, but only, only to bring glory and honor to him. Because he is the one that's worthy. We're going to take some time, and I want us to pray together today. We haven't done this in a couple of weeks, so I want us to pray together today. And here's, here's three things I want to pray about, and then I'll wrap our time up. First of all, we want to be thankful. We want to be thankful to God for the hope that we have in Jesus. That's the hope that we have. We should be thankful for that. We should, we should pray for perseverance, that we continue to follow hard after him, that we pursue the God of the universe that, that loved us so much. And then finally, we probably need to do some repenting too. <laughs> because as we, we get caught up in this whole idea of searching for earthly trophies, we sometimes can lose a little bit of perspective of what matters in eternity. So, thankful for the hope we have, asking God for perseverance to continue on day by day, even in hard times, and repent for stuff that we, we just get misdirected in our lives. So take a moment, bow your head, close your eyes, pray. If you want to pray out loud, that's great. If you want to pray silently, that's fine. But we need to really come before God and pray together today. And then I'll finish our time up in just a second.